Uh, here we go. So in three, two. Good morning, this is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I call to order a special meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, this morning's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live. The sole purpose of this special meeting is to update the Board of Education and the community on universal masking in Baltimore County Public Schools for the 2021-2022 school year. No other business will be discussed this morning. May I please have a roll call to determine the members of the board that are present in this meeting? Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Mr. McMillian? Present. Ms. Jose? Present. Ms. Hen? Mr. Thomas? Here. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pasture? Present. Mr. Kuhn? Dr. Hager? Present. <clears throat> Ms. Scott? Present. Ms. Scott, there are six present. Thank you. So a quorum of the board is not present. Therefore, we are unable to con conduct business or take any action. However, I ask that staff proceed with the presentation to provide the board and community information related to universal masking in BCPS. At this time, I call on Dr. Wheatley Phillips. Good morning, Chairwoman Scott and members of the board. On July 27, 2021, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, revised its guidance regarding the wearing of masks and recommended that everyone in K-12 wear a mask while indoors, regardless of vaccination status. The CDC Morbidity and Mortality Report, the MMWR of July 27, 2021 states, although increasing COVID-19 vaccination coverage remains the most effective means to achieve control of the pandemic, additional layered prevention strategies will be needed in the short term to minimize preventable morbidity and mortality. Additionally, the MMWR report notes, to maximize protection of the community, prevention strategy should be strengthened or added if transmission worsens. Moreover, this report advises decisions to add or remove effective prevention strategies should be based on local data and public health recommendations. According to the July 26, 2021 update to the COVID data dashboard found on the BCPS website, COVID transmission has increased. Consequently, consistent with the recent CDC recommendation and following consultation with medical experts, all BCPS students and staff will be required to wear masks while indoors in schools for the fall of the 2021-22 school year. The revision to the school system's mitigation plan has the support of local leaders, including Baltimore County Executive Johnny Ocheski and Baltimore County Health Officer Dr. Gregory William Branch. Masking, physical distancing, and maintaining proper hand hygiene have been key strategies advocated to reduce the transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Although COVID-19 vaccines authorized in the U.S. remain effective against severe outcomes such as hospitalizations and death, emerging evidence suggests that the fully vaccinated persons who become infected with the Delta variant are at risk for transmitting it to others. On July 1st, the Baltimore County 
rate was 4.7 in the CDC's blue zone for low transmission. But by July 30th, it had increased to 39.2 in the CDC's yellow zone for moderate transmission. Advisors have told us that Baltimore County will likely be in a substantial rate of transmission by mid-August. Coupled with this information is the knowledge that children under the age of 12 are still not eligible for vaccination at this juncture. It is with these factors in mind and at the guidance of staff from the CDC, the health experts from Johns Hopkins, and the University of Maryland at universal indoor masking for all Baltimore County teachers, staff, students, and visitors in K-12 schools, regardless of vaccination status, has been instituted for the fall of the 2021-22 school year. The consistent use of layered prevent prevention strategies decreases transmission of COVID-19, and masks have been shown to be the most effective prevention strategy after vaccination. The correct and consistent use of well-fitting masks will reduce the number of close contacts requiring quarantine and missed instruction. Baltimore County Public Schools will continue to monitor regularly and adjust guidance in consultation with our health experts. We have received several inquiries related to the virtual learning program. The opportunity to register for the program was originally announced to all BCPS families in mid-May and was accompanied by a parent information session held on May 19, 2021. This session was recorded and posted on the VLP website. At that time, the deadline to register was May 31, 2021. However, on June 4, in order to be responsive to students' needs, BCPS announced to all BCPS families that the enrollment window would be extended to July 2, 2021. This second deadline was necessary to implement and enforce for planning and staffing purposes. As such, we are no longer accepting enrollments at this time. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Our staff is available to answer questions at this time. Thank you for that, Dr. Um, Wheatley Phillips. And um, do I have any questions from any board members? If you have questions, um, please um, put so put your name in the chat so that I can properly call on anyone who would like to hear additional information or have additional questions. But that was very thorough. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's a question it looks like from um, Mr. Thomas. Please go ahead. And then after that, Dr. Hager. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was uh, amazing, very thorough, like Ms. Scott said. Um, but my first question is, uh, what are the metrics needed for the mask mandate to uh, be subsided after, you know, in the fall semester or school year? Um, and is there a, a current date in mind or a month that is being considered as like the time when the mask mandate would be expired? So thank you so much for that question. Your question is, what are the current metrics um, for the mass mandate to be lifted as well as is there a date that's available for that? I know that we have Ms. Deb Somerville on the call and I'd like to ask her to provide any additional information that we have at this time. Ms. Somerville. Thanks, Dr. Wheatley Phillips. Um, yes, so um, Mr. Thomas, um, there's not a specific number that we're looking at. Um, the CDC guidance really says masks in schools right now for all. Um, but I think what we're going to do is be watching our trends. And certainly if we get back where we were July 1 in the blue zone, which is 10 cases, 10 cumulative cases per 100,000 residents over a seven day period. And we saw that to be stable and in consultation with our ex health experts felt that our our prevalence rates were really low, um, we certainly will be revisiting um, the mandate. So I think it's more fluid because we need to be looking at trends and we need to be looking at the context of where the cases are really with the population of students and staff in our schools. So um, I wish I could give an absolute number, but I can say probably the easiest number would be to look for that blue zone. Thank you. And uh, I kind of have a follow up question to that. Um, are we planning any other mitigation strategies in our schools for the school year besides mask wearing? Uh, I know that we're going to near full capacity in the school year starts, so social distancing might be off the table. Uh, but besides masks, are there any other things that we're doing to prevent COVID? Sure. Uh, 
Sure, absolutely. So layered prevention strategies remain in um, in place. Um, and so although we're not doing strict physical distancing, we will be doing physical distancing to the mas maximum extent possible. So that's going to continue um, with careful work from staff in terms of the layout of desks, um, the how we move students through the hallways. All those things are going to be in place to prevent um, inadvertent exposure. Um, we are also adding screening testing this year. We're working with the state and the federal government to obtain tests to look and use those in targeted ways to support um, to support um, mitigation. Uh, we'll be um, continuing the efforts we had last year in terms of ventilation, making sure our systems are operating with a maximum air exchange and the best filter for the unit so that we're having good filtration and good air exchange. Um, we're going to be reinforcing the concept of staying home if you're sick and wash your hands and cough into your sleeve if you don't have a mask on. We'll still be doing the strict contact tracing um, and we'll still be doing that daily cleaning. So all of those layers will be in place for the fall and throughout the year um, and we'll step them up and become more intensive as the science and the data trends tell us to and we'll step back when we can. Thank you. And um, Miss Scott, can I ask one more question? Yep, one more. All right, thank you. Um, uh, so a lot of the mandates are going on right now are for uh, school buildings for staff and students. Uh, are there any conversations happening about uh, providing, requiring masks in the Greenwood campus or on other campuses in BCPS that students aren't going to be present in? Um, did you get that, Miss Somerville? You went out, Christian. I did get it. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, so the four offices we will our plan is to follow the CDC guidance, which is to um, mask when you get to substantial or high transmission in the community. So we're continuing to monitor our data as of this morning. We're still in a moderate transmission, but once you know, honestly, the predictions are that we will in August hit that substantial transmission category and when that happens staff will be alerted and we'll be asking them to mask. The same other mitigation is in place in offices in terms of cleaning, in terms of contact tracing, physical distancing, all those um, strategies are applied at the office site as well as at the school site. Great, thank you for that. Um, it looks like next is uh, Dr. Hager. Yes, <clears throat> thank you uh, for the information. I am um, as a public health professional and a mother of a child who is not vaccinated because she's too young. I am actually very, very pleased to see this. Uh, it was something I've been very concerned about and, and given the increased rate of transmission and new variants, um, I think I, I personally, my personal opinion is that we made the right decision. Um, I have a few specific questions. One, um, I've asked this before, but just wanted to get an updated answer on whether we have any plans to track vaccination status of staff or students um, as we enter the fall. So thank you so much for that question. I'd like to call on Ms. Somerville again to um, share with us because I think that is absolutely in her wheelhouse. Ms. Somerville. Thank you. So um, at this point, I have not been involved in discussions about tracking vaccination status of staff. Um, I think that would be something that would have to be um, extensively discussed. So that part I don't have the capacity to do. Um, our electronic health uh, record um, system has historically had a connection with the Maryland Immunet, which is the Maryland Immunization Database. And so any um, any vaccines that students receive are automatically uploaded into the um, Immunet and they are downloaded into our registry so that we're able to track, you know, honestly MMRs for students and make sure that they're compliant with state requirements. We can use that registry to look at vaccination rates um, and at, at, you know, we can certainly do that. At this point, there's not a discussion to track students individually, um, but would we be able to look it up because of our immunet registration? Absolutely, we, we can determine that. And, and do you have an idea of how many Baltimore County Public School students who are eligible are vaccinated or is it? I feel like because it's under 12 aren't eligible, it may be challenging to, to make that calculation. 
Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't give you overall. I can say that if you look at, you know, if you look at the COVID dashboard for the county, we can kind of make some extrapolation because most of those students, most of the children under, so I think the age group goes up to 19 and they break it into two chunks, you know, so but it's less than 50%. Um, so I think it's really important for us to remember that even of the eligible population in Baltimore County, less than 50% of our 18 and unders appear to have been vaccinated based on our county level data. Great, thank you. And that's even more reason for masking in schools. So thank thank you for that answer. Um, I did see another county that um, specifically said that if there was a child that had direct exposure that was tracked through contact tracing, that if they were vaccinated, that they would not need to quarantine. Um, has there been any dis discussion about that um, moving forward into the fall? Ms. Somerville. Yes. So, um, so we follow the, regardless of student or staff, we follow the CDC guidelines in terms of quarantines of people after exposure. Um, and there were actually, Dr. Hager, an update, I think the middle of last week in terms of quarantine guidance. Um, but where the guidance stands right now is that a vaccinated person who's so fully vaccinated two weeks after their terminal dose of the vaccine does not need to quarantine. We ask them to get tested at day three to five after exposure, and we ask them to mask until their negative test result comes back. If they don't get tested, we ask them to mask for 14 days. So in school right now, because we're universal max masking, the ultimate effect is it would look no different. They would be permitted to be at school the whole time and just keep their mask on. So that is, that's kind of where we are with vaccinated folks. And if they're not vaccinated? So unvaccinated folks are put in a quarantine period for 10 days after the date of ex last date of exposure. And they're encouraged right now, the guidance is to test at day five to seven post exposure. Um, and they're allowed back into the building after 10 days, as long as they're asymptomatic. Thank you. And so since we um, have separated out our, our virtual learning program from our in-school uh, learning for this coming year, what will that look like for children who are home for 10 days um, or up to 10 days following an exposure? Perhaps Ms. Wheatley Phillips. Oh, good. Ms. Somerville? Well, I don't want to answer. I do want to give you an important exception before we answer that, which is in a classroom, the CDC changed their guidelines in terms of ex what defines an exposure in a classroom. As long as our students are masked and no quarantine is going to be needed this year, even if a student is unvaccinated. So in an elementary classroom, as long as we're keeping that three foot distance and the universal masking, we are not going to need to quarantine. And that's been an important factor that we've considered in terms of minimizing the number of students who are exposed and at risk of catching COVID, but also required to miss school because of a, of a positive classmate. So I just wanted to jump in and finish that part of the answer because I think it's really key to the point you're bringing up. Thank you, yes, that was, that was great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, oh, I sorry. have one final question, but I, I can wait oh. until the others go. Didn't mean to cut you off there, sorry. <laughs> No, no, I, no, I have one final question, but go I can ahead, wait. Dr. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay, um, my last question is just about um, high school sports and whether there is a plan to require masking for any sports or for those that are played indoors. So thank you so much for that question. I know that um, Ms. Somerville might be able to provide some perspective on that, but I also know that we have Dr. Boswell McComas with us and as part of um, you know leading the athletics um, division, being the chief of that particular division, she might be able to provide some additional insights. So Ms. Somerville, I'd like to start with you first and then Dr. McComas, if there's anything that you would like to add for further clarity, I would appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Hager, our office works, I, I think I talked to uh, Mr. Sai at least weekly, if not multiple times weekly to make sure that they have the latest guidance from the CDC and that we integrate it with the MPSSAA guidance. So um, students who are on the field of play do not need to be masked. Students who are on the sidelines will be asked, will be masked and coaches. So it, that's essentially um, the plan for the fall is masking on the sidelines where we generally have closer contact, no masking in the field of play. Um, and we're looking at other ways to um, strengthen 
strengthen screening, honestly, for our indoor sports so that we have less risk of those sports being interrupted and of transmission. And I will just share that, um, as Ms. Somerville said, I have really nothing more to contribute. She really laid out exactly our approach. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate all of your answers to the questions, and I just hope everyone who can get vaccinated gets vaccinated. So thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Scott, okay. I have a Next question. Have... Oh, In okay. Regards... Um, this is um, Mr. McMillian. Yes, So please. I have Ms. I have Ms. Pastor ahead of you, and then well, you'll okay. go after Ms. Pastor. Okay, thanks, Rod. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Ms. Thank Pastor? You. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, uh, first, uh, Ms. Summer, Somerville and Dr. Weekly Phillip, thank you uh, for the presentation and for your responses. Uh, in light of what you're saying, I want to ask you, I guess, Dr. Weekly Phillip, uh, about some other options. Uh, one of um, my constituents that planned on sending the children, or she has three, doctor has said no, two of them have serious respiratory problems. The doctor has said absolutely not. Now, unfortunately, she missed that July 1 um, date um, because she just got this information from this doctor a week ago. Can you tell me where I can direct her for some other options uh, if she's not, since she's not able to send these children back to school. Where might she look, please? Thank you so much for that question. And we certainly don't want to ever be perceived as turning kids away from school, especially in light of how critical instruction is. What I would advise Ms. Pasteur is that that particular parent works specifically at the school level with her principal because the principal in, in, in conjunction with the DSSA team will really work to take a look at what options are available. I know that having specific deadline helps us in terms of creating firm planning. However, I think at the school level, support can be provided in terms of working with that parent, looking at community support, working with that health office to find a good resolution. Okay, would um, home teaching be an option? I know that program worked last year for, which was different from virtual, um, worked well for a number of students and they're right. going to do it again this year. And I think that that's part of the conversation that would take place at the school level. Certainly if we have a student that's impacted, bringing together a team of experts at the school level as well as central office support, they can develop the best plan for the particular student. Um, at this point, I wouldn't want to say that homeschool is an option, but I think having a conversation at the school level, looking at the needs of the child, looking at the resources that are available, the school would be able to develop a good plan for the students. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Next is Mr. McMillian and then Ms. Jose. Good morning to everyone. Good I morning. would like Ms. Summerfield or Dr. McComas or someone to clarify field of play. Uh, you know, volleyball is played indoors on a hardwood court. Would the players on the court need to be masked? Thank you. So good morning and thank you so much for that question. I'm not sure if, if Mr. Sai is on this call, but Ms. Simplea, we would certainly um, want to get back to you specifically with an answer to that question, just because the specifics of that, members of our team that are here might need to consult with other members of Team BCPS to find that answer. So we would be um, willing to provide that information to you at a later date once we are able to contact specific um, staff in the athletics department. Thank you. Okay, hey, next is Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, thank you for the presentation. A lot of my questions were already asked by other board members, but I um, do have a follow up question on um, in terms of the vaccination at 0% for children under 12 because they cannot get vaccinated. So one of the best ways to prevent them is to have all the adults around them vaccinated. And from what I understand, there's no way we can track if the adults around those children are vaccinated. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I'm going to invite Ms. Somerville in, but I do believe that as part of personally tracking individual staff or adults, I think there are some restrictions regarding that. 
um, just because they're rights and privacies that are inherent to each individual. Um, so it would be difficult to do that. Um, so is there another aspect of the question we can help with? Because I don't know that we would be able to specifically track and share that information. OK, so but but in terms of Baltimore County Public Schools, there is immunization records that public schools do require whether whether or not you're vaccinated. Is that? I mean, I know it's too too new to incorporate that, but that is a part of the Baltimore County Public Schools requirement, correct? To see if you're vaccinated or not against common communicable diseases. Right. In terms of public health, um, having a record of vaccination is part of the enrollment process for students. We do know that some students have exceptions because of religious beliefs. Um, Ms. Somerville, is there? A, this is your wheelhouse, and so I'm going to invite you to turn on your camera and come in. In the event there's something additional that you could share regarding this in terms of vaccination and and how that information could help us to ensure that we're keeping all students and staff safe. Right, so um, thank you, Dr. Reedley Phillips. So um, the um, state establishes the vaccination requirements that Baltimore County Schools enforces. So right now COVID is not a required vaccine. <laughs> As we've all talked about, it's not even available to our younger youngest learners. Um, so it's not required, but we we would if in some period of time it was required, we would have the ability to track that. Absolutely. Um, but right now, now it's not required and it's not that we would be tracking in that way. OK, thank you and thank you for the presentation. Great, thank you. And oh, it looks like there's a, a, another question from Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, are there any consequences in place right now for maybe students that would refuse to wear masks in schools or for parents that would not allow their children to wear masks in schools? Uh, what type of consequences uh, are currently being established or are there any? Thank you so much for that question. You know, within BCPS, we really strive to maintain a culture of care and support, not only for our students, but also for our staff. And we truly believe that it takes a village to raise a child, and, and many of us are familiar with that. What I would share at this time is that we, because this mandate was just implemented, we will work with school leaders, we'll work with our PTA partners, we'll work with our parents to ensure that the guidelines are met. We don't want as a school system to turn away students, but health and safety is most important. And so as this is um, a plan that was newly implemented, we will work with school partners, <coughs> parents, to ensure that the guidelines are being followed. Thank you. And um, who will be primarily responsible for ensuring that, uh, if this not answered this yet, uh, who's wearing, who's going to be wearing masks in schools? Uh, will it be teachers that are overseeing the classroom? It's going to be administrators, or is that still in the process? Absolutely, that is still in the process because it truly is a, vi a village attempt to ensure that kids are safe and that they're learning. And those plans will be developed in, in collaboration with not just only central office staff, but also with school based staff as well. So thank you for that question. Of course, and I have one final question with I think uh, the same answer may be applied here, um, but uh, are there current plans in place to make sure that we are providing masks in schools for students and uh, to provide uh, new masks and, and, and that kind of stuff? That, that's just a question. My, my last question is. Absolutely, and as part of summer planning and to part of summer conversations, we absolutely take a look, a look at all that's needed to make sure that we have a safe opening of schools. Specifically related to number of masks and, and that particular requirement, we definitely will work with not only Baltimore County Health Department, but also work with our BCPS Health Department as well, our Office of Health, to ensure that we are able to provide each school with um, the materials and resources that they need. But those plans are also underway and in development, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, do we have a, a date in mind for when all those metrics, when, when that information will be in public, like those plans? Um, is it going to be before the start of the school year? Uh, it, I, there's a lot of confusion into what kind of requirements teachers are going to be having, what kind of requirements students and families have regarding the mask mandate. And I, I just want to know if there's a date in mind for when all that stuff will be released. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. You know, as much information as we have, we share, but this is 
COVID has been an, an, um, an unprecedented event. And so we are working as a school team weekly with Dr. Williams, as well as members of our school support and our offices to ensure that we have solid plans ready for opening. So as soon as we have information, we will share that information. We're working with our communications office. And so we are developing plans, we're working. And as soon as we have information, we share it so that parents can be prepared and ready um, for the opening of schools. Okay, thank you so much uh, for everything with this presentation and thank you for taking the time to answer our questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. And um, it looks like uh, Dr. Hager, did you have follow up questions? You, you had a follow up question? Um, just one. We, um, we've we talked a lot about tracking vaccines for children and it sounds like the um, the State Department of Education, you know, provides the list of required vaccinations for children and, and um, we talked about the electronic medical record tracking system, um, but we didn't really get into the staff and teacher vaccinations. And so um, is there anything in the works for um, being able to identify which of our staff uh, which are the adults and grown-ups in the building have been vaccinated um, as we go into the fall. And so I'm going to ask Ms. Somerville if she could join us as part of this conversation to help provide any additional clarity or information regarding that. Ms. Somerville? Thanks. Um, uh, to be honest, no, there's not at this point. I've not been involved in discussions about a process to track staff vaccinations. That would be that would be a discussion. Probably it would be a voluntary sharing. I mean, the staff would have to share their vaccine status. I can say that I mentioned um, to it in an answer to an earlier question, Dr. Hager, that um, we're looking to partner with the Department of Defense and the um, State Health Department for screening test kits. And one part of our screening plan is to offer home screening test kits that we procure through that process to staff who are unvaccinated and we would be asking them to um, to test themselves each Sunday or Monday morning. Um, and so that uh, program would be voluntary. We would not be tracking folks, so to speak, who were not vaccinated, but we would be encouraging those folks and really asking folks on the honor system to track themselves weekly and test themselves weekly if they've not been vaccinated. So that's a, another way, a different approach to um, ensuring safety that um, kind of honors people's privacy without um, getting into tracking their vaccine status. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like Ms. Josie had a follow up question. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Real um, quick, we did have mask requirements before we shut down for um, the last school year. And were there any issues with elementary school children, kindergarten or pre-K wearing masks? And are we providing additional uh, PPE to all of our schools in case some of the children forget their masks? Um, things like that. Absolutely, and, and those are the questions that we're asking as a team as we meet each week. And certainly, you know, as I shared a little bit earlier, it really is a village approach. It is working with not just only school leaders and central office, staff, but also our PTA partners and members of our community, because what we want is to ensure that each child is safe and each child is learning. And so therefore, in terms of the specific protocol that will be followed, if there are students that come to school without a mask, that those decisions and those steps, that process will be developed working in collaboration with our partners, because what we want is to ensure first and foremost safety, but we also want to make sure that the guidelines are being followed. OK, thank you. Thank you. And um, I would just like to say I think that these questions have been um, very, very beneficial um, and most informative and the presentation was excellent. And I would like I know we want once our schools open, we want them to remain open. That's the goal. So um, the work that we're putting in and, and everything to make sure that that happens, I, I think is 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 really good. Um, we're on the right path. Um, I would also like to thank the board members who are here. I know we don't have a quorum, but the six board members who are here and asked very thought provoking informative questions, Dr. Hager, Ms. Jost, Ms. Pastor, Mr. Thomas, 
Mr. McMillian, and I just wanted to, um, and myself, but I just wanted to make sure um, that I acknowledge that, that you're here and um, that you asked very informative questions on this very serious subject. So are there any additional questions? Ms. Scott, this is Daryl Williams. Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh my goodness. Good morning, Dr. Williams. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank the team for presenting. Um, fortunately, I was unable to be there, but I did uh, log on. I just want to circle back to the questions, and I think I want to start where Ms. Joes left off. What we've learned from our summer school that uh, we were recommending masks. That was the state in which we were in when we started our summer school. And having visited summer school uh, classes and schools, our staff and our principals and our central office staff were very helpful um, in looking at issues, addressing issues. And so I think what we've learned from this summer, what we learned from this spring, will tell us what we need to do in the fall to help our students um, to be prepared as well as our staff. It's just a matter of working with the team and coming up with some guidance around if a student doesn't have a mask, if someone is not feeling well. These are things that we uh, experienced when we brought back students back in March and once again when we had our summer program. And so I appreciate the questions today. Uh, more information. I think we will be providing more inf information every week, especially for our schools. The big factor is that the experts are telling us what we need to do. In terms of the staff, I know that's a question about their vaccination status, and I know in colleges it's a different um, approach. We are in exploring that question uh, with our partners. We're exploring that question with the Maryland State Department of Education uh, so we can be aligned with other districts, other systems. Uh, so stay tuned. We may have some additional information about the tracking of staff right now. Like Deb Somerville said, there's still a lot of questions around that. Um, in terms of consequences uh, for masking, we still want to encourage our students to mask. Um, and if not, we will have a backup plan because the last thing we want to do is close school um, because we want to push more in-person learning um, as we open up our school year. So again, I just want to thank the staff for presenting today um, and thank the board members who were able to rearrange their schedule to be present to ask questions. These questions we will definitely um, keep on our list to make sure we have answers as we move forward for the start of the school year on August 30th. So thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And um, thank you, staff, for an uh, excellent presentation and board members for um, uh, your very thought provoking questions. And um, I, I think that um, um, we have a, a plan going forward. Were there any other questions or comments? OK, hearing none. Um, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next um, board meeting will be held on Tuesday, August 10th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. I thank you all for joining us this morning and the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a good day.